Three Houses has a plethora of amazing characters from every single one of the houses and the church itself. This game cast ranks up there with Awakening, Shadows of Valencia, and Path of Radiance among my favorite Fire Emblem casts ever. The relatively small cast allowed IS to really focus on making every character memorable and lovable in their own way. And while there are some characters I didn't care for, it was more a statement about me than about the characters. I can think of no character I would point to as disliked by most of the fandom in this game. Kudos to IS for pulling off that feat. Although, maybe one or two are just ignored. Of course, that level of quality character work made this list very difficult to make, and there are going to be plenty of splendid characters left off this list. Here are the important notes then for this video. These rankings are purely my opinion. Don't take this list as an objective ranking of characters either by personality or unit performance. I used to do character lists in written form when I was on the Fire Emblem Amino app, and I found a format I really liked for those lists, so I'll be doing that here as well. For those posts, each character got two sections about them. One about why they're on the list, highlighting positive aspects about them, and one section about why they aren't higher on the list, except the number one character, of course, that talks more about what brings them down. We're almost to the countdown now, but the final thing before we get started is spoilers. In order to talk about many of these characters, I need to give context for my opinions from events that take place throughout the game. Therefore, this video is not spoiler free. Let's get started then with these legendary lords and ladies, starting with number 10. Number 10, Annette. Why she made the list. Annette is one of the sweetest characters in the entire cast, and that's certainly saying something. Her kindness and bubbly personality is evident throughout all of her supports, including her classic singing moments during her support with Felix. She is the niece of Baron Dominique from the Holy Kingdom of Fargus and the daughter of the Knight Gustav, later revealed to be our very own Gilbert. Her support with Gilbert is touching and makes me sympathize heavily with her. His sudden departure from the family after the tragedy of Dusker proved to be the impetus for Annette's fanatical devotion towards getting into the officer's academy because she knew that Gilbert would come to the Church of Saros after leaving the family. She started out in the School of Sorcery, where she met her best friend Mercedes, and her drive is incredible and, in this case, successful. I love her work ethic and study habits because it reminds me of friends of mine. Sometimes though, work ethic is not enough, and her development in certain supports to learning that is compelling. Oh, and she's also very clumsy, which I think pairs nicely with her perseverance to make her a relatable character. In battle, she's a fairly good unit, in my opinion, because magic is an extremely useful skill in three houses. Her strengths are found in her magic and dexterity stats, and her strengths in studying are in axes, reason magic, and authority. She also has the Minor Crest of Dominique, which when triggered gives her extra uses of her magic skills. All very useful, and she had great performance during my runs with her. Why she isn't higher. Annette's a great character, and has good depth below the surface seen in her support with Gilbert especially. Her clumsiness does occasionally get overplayed, but her main downfall character-wise is not being as compelling as the ones higher on the list. Unit-wise, she has a little more to bring her down, starting with not as great stats for the always helpful speed. Especially on higher difficulties, this causes her to struggle to keep up with mages like Lysithia and Dorothea since they can double enemies when Annette can't. Her low movement as a mage class also makes her less viable on the larger endgame maps. Our next character in those same maps, though, does not have that problem. Number 9, Claude. Why he made the list. And cue a comment storm about Claude not being higher. I'll explain that later, but first let's focus on the positives. Claude, heir to House Regan and leader of the Golden Deer, is a sass master, and a funny and well-meaning character. He has very understandable ambitions to tear down Fodlin's isolation from the rest of the world due to his backstory because of the prejudice surrounding his mixed Fodlin and Almira heritage. He brings out the best in a lot of the characters around him during his standout supports with characters like Lysithia and Hilda, and is always invested in the well-being of those he cares about. That includes the people of Fodlin, and he's shown throughout all paths to be a master strategist, who even in defeat, gains at least some victory for his people in the process. 
He is the most pragmatic and down-to-earth lord in the game, and possesses a rare intelligence allowing him to pick up on hidden truths on his own, like the ones hidden by the Church of Saros. Unsurprisingly, as one of the lords, he is also a very good unit. He excels in dexterity, luck, charm, because of course, and speed. His strength growth is also not bad, even if he got strength screwed in my run with him. He has talents in swords, bows, authority, riding, and flying, and with investment can get a budding talent in axes. All those options make him a very versatile unit. Add to that his class line and hero's relic fail not, and Claude should never be a liability on the battlefield. Why is he not higher? And now the reason he is this low on the list. Claude to me is just too perfect a character. No matter what path you take, Claude is flawless. Even in the Black Eagles route where he's defeated, he engineered the defeat to benefit the people. Finding a flaw with Claude is extremely difficult, and unfortunately that makes him hard to relate to. At least for me, imperfect person that I am. Unit-wise, as I said before, he's amazing. However, he is actually the worst unit of the three lords. His defense and resistance are low, and if he doesn't get some luck, strength can become an issue like it did in my playthrough. Since he becomes a flying unit if you stay with the automatic promotion, that adds a major weakness to archers that again the other two lords don't have. Maybe then, for the next character, I'll turn from the nobles to the commoners. Number 8. Dorothea. Why she made this list. I was a bit iffy on Dorothea when I first got to know her, expecting her to have flirtation be the dominant aspect of her personality. While it's certainly an important part, it hides, probably deliberately, the depth of her character. Born a commoner on the streets of the Empire, she was orphaned at a young age and resorted to begging until someone heard her voice talent and she catapulted to stardom at the Middle Frank Opera Company. However, fame brought unwanted attention in several manners, so Dorothea had to learn to defend herself early on in her career. She then joined the Officers Academy, where one of her stated goals is finding a suitable noble husband. She never forgets her origins, though, and routinely challenges the nobles at the Academy about their views and negligence towards the people they're supposed to be responsible for. Her supports with any of the nobles show this, especially Ferdinand's, but she is not close-minded. When the nobles change and do good, she is there to praise and help them. She is also extremely friendly, reaching out to characters like Bernadetta and Petra despite or possibly because of their outsider status. She is simply a wonderful person and character that is a delight to witness interacting with people in this world. As a unit, Dorothea is actually pretty balanced, with HP, magic, dexterity, speed, luck, resistance, and charm all being decent, although with fewer standout abilities. Her proficiencies are in swords and reason magic. She does have a deficiency in faith magic that can then be turned into a proficiency since she has a budding talent in it. She's got some excellent spells to go along with those stats, making her another useful magic unit to bring into battle. Why is she not higher? Look, I like all of Dorothea's potential partners. Ferdinand, Felix, Edelgard, Petra, Byleth, Caspar, Sylvain, Manuela, and wait, Hanuman? Look, I like most of Dorothea's potential partners, but it seems like her endings are so focused about finding a partner, it doesn't really gel with the confident woman she is in most supports. It's like she always has to be a love interest and can't simply have friends. It's a minor nitpick, but that's what we gotta do to separate these characters on this list. On the battle side of things, she has many good skills but lacks great ones, so she's more susceptible to bad luck when it comes to growths than other characters. Plus, her faith magic spells aren't all that impressive, unlike her reason magic spells. Hey though, she looks good doing it, as do most of these characters, including... Number 7. Ingrid why she made this list. Ingrid, daughter of Count Galatea, has one major ambition. Just one. To be a knight. Not just any knight, the best knight. Like no one ever was. She's already well on her way there, according to Dimitri, and her dedication and no-nonsense attitude resonated with me. Due to this focus, she hasn't had much time left over to focus on makeup and fashion, which is constantly pointed out in her supports with fellow girls. I do like that it is portrayed as being a time issue, not an interest issue. 
Ingrid simply has other things to focus on, but when characters like Annette want her to try makeup, she is willing to go along with it for her friends and seems to enjoy herself. She feels out of place at times in those situations, but never seems too uncomfortable. In most situations, though, she is bold, especially when laying down the law to Sylvain, which is always a treat to watch. Her backstory includes the death of her fiancé Glenn during the tragedy of Dusker. It helps explain her continued drive to achieve her goals despite her father trying to force other marriages on her, since she is clearly not over that death. Marriages her father feels are necessary because of the family's poor state and the fact that she has a crest and that makes her appealing to families of greater social standing in Folkland society. This reality leaves Ingrid feeling selfish for refusing the request and prioritizing her own desires to be a knight, a choice no character ever wants to make between their own dreams and their families. As a unit, her best skills are speed and charm, with decent growths in most other areas. In fact, she has few weaknesses, including having no deficiencies in skills. She is proficient, though, in swords, lances, riding, and flying. Her riding and flying abilities also improve her unit performance because it allows her to move quickly through the largest maps and retreat with the Kanto ability. Seriously, high movement units are incredibly helpful in three houses. Why is she not higher? Fire Emblem has handled the topic of prejudice before. Their best effort was with the character Jill in Path of Radiance. Ingrid, because of her loss in the tragedy of Dusker, has issues with the Dusker people highlighted in her supports with Dudu. She does learn to get over those feelings by the end of the support chain, but it's not handled with the same grace that Jill's development was. That knocks her a bit in my eyes, because I don't feel the game ever truly had her acknowledge how wrong she had been at the beginning beginning of the support chain. For battle, I said she has few weaknesses. As a flyer, though, archers will be a weakness, and even if she goes another route, she, like Dorothea before her, is susceptible to a few bad rolls of the RNG screwing her over. Strength especially is a skill I found occasionally held her back, even if she did have the most kills on my Blue Lions run and the fifth most for my Silver Snow one. Racking up the kills isn't the only way to impress me, though, as demonstrated by my next entrant. Number 6. Marianne Why she made this list? One of the unique aspects of the world of Fodlin are crests, blood-based abilities that help with battle and have a strong genealogical component. Marianne is the first character on this list whose characterization is bound up in her crest, and I love when writers find unique ways their magical system affects the characters in society. Marianne specifically has the Minor Crest of the Beast, otherwise known as the Crest of Maurice, a former soldier who fought alongside Nemesis, and who later on turned into a beast. This development led to the impression that the Crest is cursed, and so Marianne's father hid her away, and then later her adopted father was very protective of her and the Crest. Because of this, Marianne is very shy, much more comfortable around animals than humans, extremely religiously devout, and rather pessimistic about herself specifically. Such a well-constructed backstory, Marianne, though over the course of the game, if she's in your army, learns that she is not in fact cursed, and her blossoming from that knowledge into a more confident, optimistic person is heartwarming to see. Her supports with Linhart really show that development, and she has great interactions with Hilda as well. She truly is a gem of a character for many reasons. Her ending is also very satisfying, with her training and becoming an amazing orator to the surprise of those who knew her in adolescence. Unit-wise, she has pretty solid stats in many key areas, with her top skills being magic, resistance, and charm, while speed and dexterity aren't bad either. Her proficiencies include swords, faith magic, riding, and flying with a potential budding talent in lances. I found her very effective as a healer, although her damage output isn't high, and also incredible at the dancer class, which uses magic and swords, making her an amazing utility unit. Why is she not higher? Her characterization and backstory connect so well into the lore of the game. It's like a class on creative usage of ideas. In fact, she moved up on my list as I was writing the script because of it. However, I found that the characters in front of her on this list are simply more entertaining, or I connect with more. It's the classic, it's not you, it's me situation. At least for character. As a unit, I said before, she is not the best. Her spell list is alright, but doesn't have useful skills like fortify and warp, and she is very fragile against any physical unit. 
As a magic class as well, movement is a big problem in the late game portions, so she struggles to keep up. Marianne, though, is not the only shy character in the bunch, and pales in comparison to the next entrant. Number 5. Bernadetta. Why she made this list. I have previously described Bernadetta as a dramatic introvert, which may be an understatement. Her social anxiety and borderline paranoia about the people around her is quite understandable given her backstory. The only daughter of House Varley, Bernadetta's father early on began to train her to be the model wife so he could use her to gain political power. And when I say train, I mean abuse. Including, but not limited to, tying her to a chair and beating a commoner boy who dared to become friends with her. She is therefore very shy around people, and especially commoners, as seen in Dorothea's support. She does not feel she is safe at any moment, always assuming her classmates will take offense at her presence. Most of these are comedic and played for laughs, but this only works because her classmates genuinely care for her and teach her that her abusive past will not follow her here. She remains a recluse most of the time, but she learns greater confidence and to open herself up to friendship. She is also extremely charming and talented, with her cooking, sewing, writing, and interest in carnivorous plants being featured in certain supports. Bernadetta is a delightful character. As a unit, Bernadetta excels in speed and dexterity, and is pretty good with charm as well. She has proficiencies in lances and bows, and has a budding talent in riding, meaning pretty much bow knight is the way to go with her. The bow's range allows her to be good at chipping away health without being countered and taking out flyers. However, why she is not higher. Archers are simply not the best units in most Fire Emblem games, and Three Houses isn't an exception. Bernadetta's strength, defense, and resistance aren't going to wow anyone, meaning her offensive and defensive potentials are rather limited. Not to mention the fact that if you have Shamir already as an archer on your team, Bernadetta will be blown out of the water unit-wise. Character-wise, I have few complaints when it comes to Bernadetta. Her supports are truly a delight to watch, even when they're heartbreakingly sad. Speaking of heartbreakingly sad... Number 4. Dimitri. Why he made this list. The prince of the Holy Kingdom of Fargus and house leader of the Blue Lions, Dimitri seemed to me like the least interesting lord when I first viewed the trailers, and boy was I wrong. Dimitri is kind, loyal, and thoughtful, albeit with a dark side that emerges on occasion. Dimitri has the best character arc of all the lords. He lost his father, stepmother, and many close friends in the tragedy of Dusker, only barely making it out alive himself. He set out to go after the real culprits while advocating to stop the prejudice of the Dusker people like to do. This drive becomes a near obsession for Dimitri, revealing his dark rage under the surface when his recollection of the tragedy was triggered. When Edelgard, his former childhood friend and stepsister, is revealed to be the Flame Emperor and in league with the real instigators of the tragedy, something in Dimitri snaps. He turns from the noble and idealistic lord we grew to love in the first half of the story into a weapon of pure hatred and revenge devoted only to eradicating those who opposed him. This transformation is startling, even though we as players saw it coming, and his subsequent descent into madness and then realization of the depths he has sunk to is a gripping tale. After the death of Rodrigue at the hands of Fleisch, seeking revenge for her brother, Dimitri confronts what he has become, and with Dedu's and Byleth's help, steps back from the brink. He returns to his more noble ways, but with a pragmatic air that makes him an excellent leader for the future of Fodlin. It is a character arc unlike any seen by a Fire Emblem Lord before, and it is amazing. He is also amazing on the battlefield with solid strength, HP, dexterity, speed, charm, and even some defense. His proficiencies are in swords, lances, and authority with a budding talent in riding. The lance as his primary weapon allows him a lot of versatility with countering ranged attacks and many different types of foes. Not that he really needs help because his stats are so good you could give him a carrot and he'd still be able to do damage. Why is he not higher? Dimitri has many wonderful qualities, and so trying to sort out why he didn't make it higher is hard. In this case, it comes down to two reasons, I think. One is that simply the characters above are ones I related to more in certain ways, or ones I strongly sympathized with. 
Dimitri got that sympathy, but it was offset occasionally by his blindness to realities that should have been obvious, at least to me. The second part is that I found his supports just good, not great. Even important ones like his support with Dudu didn't blow me away, they were simply good. Have I told y'all I'm nitpicking at this point yet? No? Well I am. Surprisingly enough, I don't have that problem with number 3 on the list, but I love her all the same. Number 3, Edelgard. Why she made this list. Determined revolutionary or warmongering despot? It depends on the path when it comes to Edelgard, but on the Black Eagle's path which I played first, she definitely fits in the first category. Like many other Three Houses characters, Edelgard's backstory is mired in misfortune. She is the princess and heir to the Adrestian Empire because she was the only survivor of the experiments of those who slither in the dark. They managed to give her two crests through blood experiments that killed all ten of her siblings, all this perpetrated by her uncle Arendelle. Edelgard took this violation of her and is using the power she now wields to break the system to its core, targeting specifically dominant systems like the Crest System and the Nobility. This desire for change takes her in conflict with the Church of Saros as well due to their support of the status quo and the lies and manipulations Rhea and others wove for the Church. Edelgard is a bold visionary even when she's the villain, and after going through her route I really sympathized with her. It helps that she's a kind and considerate ruler to her subjects. She is described as cold but refined and noble. That's certainly the surface level, Edelgard, but under that is a childish sweetness that I think shows her trying to recover moments of a childhood that was lost to torture and torment. Whether that's the desire to eat sweets in bed all day or the painting she tries to paint of Byleth, which is adorable, those moments are heart-achingly cute. She is an understanding character with great supports with her allies, where she works to understand them and gain their trust. She may work with those who slither in the dark to accomplish her goals, but she never forgets their role in her misery, and plots to undermine them now and then destroy them later. Just like the other lords, Edelgard is an outstanding unit with across the board excellent stats. Her greatest skills though are strength and charm with her lowest stat being luck. As for proficiencies, she has swords, axes, brawling, authority, and heavy armor with a budding talent and reason magic. Plus, she has two crests, both of which have pretty good abilities, although the crest of Saros is more situational. It's hard to beat such a wide and varied skill set, as I'm sure your enemies will find out when you deploy her for battle. Why is she not higher? Edelgard, like Claude, has a very flat arc as a character, especially when compared to Dimitri's gripping roller coaster of an arc. I think there was an opportunity to give her a more dynamic arc with a confrontation with Arendelle and her tormentors, but instead of having the Empire wage war with the group, the writers decided to resolve it through the end screen endings instead of in game. A missed opportunity that caused Edelgard's character to suffer in my eyes. For battle, really the only thing you could possibly critique when it comes to Edelgard is perhaps her resistance and her low movement since she's only average skill with riding or flying. She is undeniably a strong unit. She'll need her allies behind her though to still win. And one of those allies is... Number 2, Petra. Why she made this list. Portraying foreigners to a land in any form of media is difficult. One of the biggest problems I see in foreign characters is a tendency to reduce their intelligence when portraying them as out of place. Petra, as the foreign princess of Brigid, a vassal of the Empire, could have fallen into this trap, and may seem to on a surface level because of her struggle with the language of Fodlin. However, reading her supports shows that Petra is highly intelligent with great instinctual knowledge and depth of thought. Combine that with a charming and friendly character, and you've got my second favorite character in the entire game. Her insight into the emotional states of the other characters is impressive, and she is forthright and bold in everything she attempts, showing a very mature disposition. She uses her struggles to relate to the people around her and is inquisitive about many things, which makes her an excellent conversation partner for this cast of varied characters. She is just a perfect personality to mesh with this world and characters, and she certainly swept me off my feet. Unit-wise, she is best with speed and dexterity. Her HP, luck, and strength are no slouch either, though. This makes her a pretty good offensive unit with evasion as a major part of defense against enemies, which is incredibly annoying when you have to face her in battle yourself. 
She is proficient in swords, axes, bows, and flying, giving her several directions she can go in class-wise, including the High Movement Falcon Knight or Assassin, which plays to her unit strengths. Why is she not higher? The question, though, is why is she not number one? On the character side, while she has her struggles, they pale in comparison to what characters like Dimitri, Edelgard, or the number one entry went through. Seeing those characters overcome their past is so rewarding it's hard to live up to without that background. On the unit side, because dodging is an unreliable tactic in Fire Emblem, her fragility makes Petra an occasional liability, especially with her low resistance making her very susceptible to magic attacks. Speaking of magic, it's time for our number one entry, and we shouldn't keep her waiting because she can get rather impatient. Number one, Lysithia. Why she made this list. Lysithia, like Edelgard, is a survivor of the experiments of those who slither in the dark. This happened when the Empire took over House Ordelia after a rebellion in the Empire, despite the fact that Ordelia's territory was in the Alliance. Her siblings died in the process, but Lysithia survived with two crests. This result, though, also dramatically shortened her life expectancy, driving her to work as hard as she could to achieve her goals, one of which results in her becoming the youngest student at the Officer's Academy. She knows she can never be at rest if she wants to achieve as much as she can before her time runs out. The backstory explains her prodigy status as a mage, her dislike of being treated as a child since she doesn't have time to be a child, and her general level of impatience. She is brilliant in many respects, comparable to loot from Sacred Stones, but with greater social awareness. Lysithia values her friends and can acknowledge when she's gone too far in telling them what to do. Blunt she may be, but she is also able to recognize when she is wrong, which actually shows rare maturity for someone her age. On the topic of childishness, though, she does have a weakness for sweets and an intense fear of ghosts, which is something I can relate to. At least the first part. This prodigy is certainly a charming and tragic character, but how does she perform on the battlefield? Unsurprisingly, Lysithia is incredible in battle. She is a glass cannon character with magic, speed, and dexterity being her best stats. She is proficient in both reason and faith magic and authority, not to mention a budding talent in swords, and her spell list is incredible. Dark Spikes is an automatic cavalry kill, including the Death Knight himself. Warp is always a powerful spell to have, and she can even tank somewhat well with Nosferatu in her arsenal. Couple this with the Thyrus Relic that extends her range, and she's unstoppable. As if that wasn't enough, Lysithia also has two crests. The Karen Crest doesn't do much since it only activates with combat arts, which magic doesn't have, but the Crest of Gloucester occasionally adds 5 points to her damage. She invariably one-hits most enemies and has a second one left over if they somehow survive the first. Plus, her personal skill Mastermind gives her double experience for skills, which includes classes. She is an incredibly useful unit on any difficulty, and essential on the higher ones. All this makes Lysithia my favorite character among this wonderful cast of lovable lords and ladies. She is likely even equaled or surpassed loot on my list of favorite mages in series history. I'm glad in some of the endings she manages to reverse the damage to her and live a long and happy life. Three Houses cast was excellent, and a real treat to interact with. And I only covered 10 characters here. I could probably do an 11 to 20 character list and have just as much stuff to praise. I really think this is one special group of students. Thank you for listening to my opinion. Please leave your top 10 favorite characters list down in the comments to show appreciation for all these amazing lads and ladies. Please tune in tomorrow for the final video of Fire Emblem Week, and leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more Fire Emblem and video game content, and I will see you in the next video. Have a great day, and happy gaming.